All right, so you've invested some money in cryptocurrency, but now you have this uneasy feeling in your stomach of, right, but where do my coins actually live though? Do they live on the exchange? Do they live on my wallet? And how does the distributed blockchain play in with all of this? Let's remove the mystery and level up together. Welcome back to Woodland Pools, your place for the latest Cardano news, tutorials, and the information you need to grow your investment with confidence. Today, let's take a look at the idea of where your crypto actually lives. True story, kind of embarrassing. I remember when I first got into crypto, I remember I was sending some Bitcoin off of the exchange onto my Ledger hardware wallet. And as the transactions were being confirmed, I remember thinking, okay, well, can I unplug my hardware wallet yet? Or what happens if my computer dies? Is my, my Bitcoin gonna be just lost to the ether? And it was kind of a nervous feeling, right? Like in terms of where are my coins actually residing and how does all of this work? If you're watching this video, you're probably feeling the same way and guess what? You and I were in good company because as it turns out, this confusion is probably our number one question on our channel. And what it really stems from is a misunderstanding of how addresses work on the blockchain, how private and public keys work with those addresses, and how all of that comes together and is managed by your wallet. So today, let's dig into how all of these different elements work together and what are different scenarios where the responsible parties for each piece are slightly different depending on if whether it's a hardware wallet, software wallet, an exchange, and what are some particular things we need to keep in mind for currencies like Cardano. Let's jump in. All right, so let's start at a high level and do a simple example with Bitcoin. So we can probably get our Cardano out of the way here. Let's move Bitcoin over and let's start with a simple example and think about existing balances on the blockchain today. So let's say we're talking about a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. It can be any crypto, but let's just say Bitcoin. We know that if we go to a specific address on the blockchain, we can see the balance of how much Bitcoin is on that address. And the idea here is that the distributed blockchain with all the different nodes that are validating the transactions are keeping track of the ledger balance of each address and how much it holds in specific addresses. So this seems intuitive enough, but then how do we tie those addresses back down to an individual wallet or location? That's where our keys come in. So for our keys, the different addresses are associated with the different public keys that correspond to a wallet. This public address is therefore tied to this public key. Both of these are publicly available on the blockchain and anyone can see them. But then we have to figure out, okay, well, what if I wanna send something from address one to address two? How do I say, yeah, I'm the one making this transaction? That's where our private keys come in. And so for our private keys, those are what live on the wallet and then we can sign to say, yes, I am the one associated with this public key, which is associated with this address, and I am verifying that I want to send something from address one to address two. Then the final layer we need to think about is then how we actually tell the network that we want to send something from address one to address two. And the way that we do that is by using a user interface, literally something that we can drag and click and type on to enter the instructions of what we want to do. So we take a look at what we already have here. The idea now is that for an address or several addresses, all of which are public, they will all correspond to some public keys that are on a specific wallet. The signature to verify transactions associated with these public addresses and public keys happen with our private key on the wallet. And we manage all of that using the user interface. So right off the bat, first thing to clarify, when we say in terms of where our funds actually live, the place that your coins actually live is out in the blockchain itself. And the way that this works is it's not even the coins themselves being stored anywhere. The distributed blockchain is really a distributed ledger that just keeps track of the balance that each address holds. So you can think of it as saying, when you wanna send one Bitcoin from address one to address three, all the blockchain is doing is saying, okay, I'm going to remove one Bitcoin from the balance on address one, and I'm going to increase the balance of address three by one Bitcoin. The net result is the same amount on the network, plus one, minus one, but now the different addresses that it corresponds to is the only thing that changes. So we've got our user interface where we type in where we wanna send it. We say we wanna send it from our address to another address. Our private key signs off and says, yes, that is me making that transaction. And then the blockchain says, okay, I'll remove one Bitcoin from this address and I will add one Bitcoin to that address. So now that we have an understanding of how addresses public and private keys and the user interface all work together, 
Let's look at a few common scenarios and get a deeper understanding of who's actually responsible for what at each of these layers. And let's start with the simplest one when we are buying and selling some crypto on an exchange. So let's say we have an exchange like Coinbase, okay? So on Coinbase, we can think of it as we log into Coinbase, we are using their user interface. Our goal is to buy some Bitcoin, right? And so since we are on Coinbase and we're doing everything on their site, we can think of it in terms of saying, okay, their user interface is obviously Coinbase's UI. That's where you're clicking and typing. The private key for my wallet is generated by Coinbase. And then additionally, the public key that is associated with the addresses on the Bitcoin blockchain are also generated by Coinbase. And so in the exchange example, your exchange, whether it's Coinbase or any other, is going to generate your public and private keys, get the corresponding addresses associated with that public key, and will also be your user interface that you use to manage all of those transactions. Now the concern here, as you can see, is that Coinbase is doing everything. And so if Coinbase was hacked and someone got access to the private keys that corresponded to your addresses, it's not that they would actually steal your Bitcoin, right? It's not like your Bitcoin lives in this wallet. Remember that your Bitcoin is really just a balance on the ledger on the blockchain. So what happens when someone hacks into an exchange and steals your crypto, what they're actually doing is they are getting access to the private keys and they are initiating transactions saying, okay, take all of the funds that live on this address associated with this public key and send them all to my wallet and since I have access to the private key for the originating address, I'm going to sign it, I'm gonna say everything is good, and let's send all the funds off of there. This is where you hear the phrase of not your keys, not your coins, right? Because the fact that the private keys are managed by Coinbase, it means that if anyone gets access to Coinbase, they have access to your keys and they can send them wherever they want as if it was theirs. So then, knowing that, the immediate thing that people ask is, okay, well, how can I make this more secure then? And that's where we get things like hardware wallets. So if we look at a hardware wallet, let's see how it would be broken up for a hardware wallet's case. We can again say, let's use same Bitcoin just to make a simple example, all right? And let's say, just for the sake of the example, we're using uh, Ledger's Nano X, okay? So what happens is you get your Ledger Nano X set up and you install Bitcoin on your Ledger. When you do that, what is happening is the ledger itself is generating the public keys and the private keys and associating those with a set of addresses on Bitcoin's distributed blockchain. And then the way that we manage these transactions, the UI that we use on Ledger is Ledger Live, right? We can open up Ledger Live, we can see our Bitcoin balance, and then we can send the funds by typing in how much we want to send and what the destination is. The same way how we were doing on Coinbase, we use Ledger Live to say, okay, I want to send funds from address one to address two. The hardware wallet itself asks us to confirm on the device to initiate the signature of the private key. When everything is verified, we then tell the public network, yes, for this address on this public key, I am signing and authorizing to send it to this other address, and I would like to send the funds to that location. And then we can see here the obvious security advantage, right? Where if the private key where the transaction is authorized lives on your ledger and never leaves your ledger, there's no way for anyone to remotely hack into it, and therefore they can't sign as you. Now, one thing that I will point out though, and this is very important, is that with the private keys, if you remember, this is for any wallet, hardware or software wallet, for the private keys, you remember when you were setting up your wallet and you had your recovery phrase? It's critically important that we understand that for wallets that are generated from a passphrase, whether it's 24 words or 15 words or some other length, the way that the private keys are generated for that wallet is directly created from the actual passphrase itself. So the algorithm that actually generates the private key literally uses those 15 or 24 words and using those words is how the private key is generated. This is why it's so convenient where if something were to happen to your ledger and it were to be destroyed or you lost it or something like that, you can always get your recovery phrase, get a new ledger, type in your 24 words in restore mode, and then you'll have generated an identical set of private and public keys because once again, they are generated from that 24 word passphrase. On the flip side, however, that's also the danger of it. If someone were to get access to your recovery phrase, then they could get their own ledger wallet, put it in restore mode, type in the 24 words, and they would get an identical set of public and private keys that would be indistinguishable from yours 
because again, it is generated directly from this passphrase. So the trade-off that we see here is that whereas there's no way for anyone to remotely hack and get access to our private keys because we're holding it on a physical device that only we have access to, if we are careless about the recovery phrase itself and we lose it or let other people see it, then they can act as if they were us, make copies of our private keys, and take our crypto. So the trade-off here with saying that you have full control over your own coins is that you have full control over your own coins. No one can restore it for you. You have full custody and responsibility to be your own bank. So let's not forget that. Okay, so so far so good. This seems pretty clear. If I'm on an exchange, they will make the keys and give me the UI to work with. If I've got a hardware wallet for something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, Ledger will make the keys and I can manage it on Ledger Live. But what about with Cardano or with similar currencies that don't have Ledger Live support? This is where people get a bit tripped up, and rightfully so, because it is a bit confusing if you're new to the space. And especially because it's slightly different if you're looking at a hardware wallet or a software wallet. So let's take a look at that. Let's remove our exchange example. We're not gonna need this anymore. And let's move our hardware wallet over for Bitcoin over to here. And let's go ahead and do a duplicate scenario where instead of Bitcoin, let's take a look at how we would do if it was with Cardano. Right, so we can hide our Bitcoin here and let's hide Ledger Live. So for Cardano, it's a little bit different. For those of you that have gone through the process of setting up a hardware wallet like Ledger or Trezor, you'll probably remember that you set up the Ledger, you got the Cardano app installed, but then when you went to open up Ledger Live, you saw that there was no way to actually manage your ADA because Ledger Live doesn't support Cardano. And if you're not familiar with hardware wallets, check out our video on setting up a Ledger Nano X from scratch, where we walk you through how to order it, how to set it up, and how to get the different apps installed for all of your favorite crypto. But so as we saw, once we get everything all set up, we can't manage Cardano through Ledger Live. And at that point, we've seen that we have to choose between three different wallets, Daedalus, Yoroi, or Adalite. So now this part usually confuses people, but if we look at what we've already seen, where that the addresses are living on the Cardano blockchain, that the public and private keys have been created for us, for Cardano, using the Ledger, we see here that really the only thing we have left is a replacement for Ledger Live as the UI, and that's where these Cardano wallets come in. So if we have something like Daedalus, the only thing that we're using Daedalus for at this point is to be that UI. We can use Daedalus, Adalite, or Yoroi interchangeably, and the reason for that is because the public and private keys are created and managed by the Ledger, and all we need the Cardano wallets for is to be able to actually serve as the interface to let us drag, point, click, and say who we wanna send things to. But the verification of those transactions and the association with the network is all managed and done for us by the ledger. And by the way, if you're at this step and you've already set up your ledger and now you have to choose between the three different wallets, check out our video comparing Daedalus, Yoroi, and Adalite to find the right wallet UI for you. So now some of you are thinking, okay, that works fine for a hardware wallet, but I'm using a software wallet. How is that different? So let's take a look at that scenario. Let's go ahead and copy this over exactly as it is. We'll drag it over here and let's make ourselves a software wallet category. Now in the software wallet category, we know that we don't have this ledger, so let's go ahead and remove it. And for those of you following along quickly, you probably remember that when you set up your Daedalus software wallet, it also presented you with a series of words for a recovery phrase. And so some of you can probably see where I'm going. For this software wallet scenario, what we see is that Daedalus is not only serving as the UI, but it's actually also serving as the way that we generate our private and public keys. In the software wallet scenario, Daedalus is how we manage our transactions and say where we wanna do things or where we wanna send them, but it is also what associates the series of addresses with our public keys, and it is also what holds the private key signature to say, yes, this is me, I'm good to approve this transaction and send these funds to a destination. And identically to our situation that we discussed with the ledger, since the private keys for Daedalus in the software wallet scenario are constructed from the recovery phrase, if someone were to get access to a recovery phrase that Daedalus gave us, they would also be able to generate duplicate keys and get access to our funds. But on the positive side, this is why it's so easy for us to restore a Daedalus software wallet and potentially have multiple wallets on multiple computers if we would like to. And by the way, if you haven't seen our video on how to set up a Daedalus software wallet, check out that video that we'll link below as well. So bringing it all together, on an exchange, we can work with any currencies we want and the exchange is responsible for everything, our public keys, our private keys, and the user interface. 
and we're aware that there's the risk that if the exchange gets hacked, they have direct access to our private keys and can send everything off as if they were us. On a hardware wallet for currencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum that are supported by Ledger Live or the native wallet's interface, we see that the wallet will generate our public and private keys for us and associate them with the blockchain. And we can manage the transactions for that through the hardware wallet's UI, such as Ledger Live or the Trezor Suite. For currencies like Cardano that are not managed through Ledger Live, we see that the public and private keys are still managed by the hardware wallet. The association of those public keys with the blockchain are done for us by the hardware wallet. But we need to choose a user interface like Daedalus, Euroi, or Adalite to help manage those transactions. And finally, if we use a software wallet like Daedalus or Euroi, the software wallet itself will generate the public and private keys, do the association with the blockchain, and also be the UI that we use to manage those transactions. If you like the idea of a hardware wallet, but aren't sure if Ledger or Trezor is right for you, check out our video where we compare the Ledger and Trezor hardware wallets. If you're using Cardano and need to decide between Daedalus, Euroi, and Adalite, check out our video that compares all three. If you like the work that we do here and you want to support the channel, please consider delegating to our Aspen stake pool, which we'll link down below. And at the very least, if you enjoyed this explanation and thought it helped clarify things, share it with a friend. We'd really appreciate it. Let us know if you have any other questions below, and we'll see you in the next video.